Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast Live. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is May 10th, 2017, uh, and we're really excited for today's interview. Uh, we are uh, continuing our series, uh, the series we're calling Losing the Lamanites. And basically, what I'm really interested in, in hearing is hearing from various people who uh, were told as they were growing up within the Mormon church that they were Lamanites, meaning that they were descendants of Lehi or Laman or Lemuel, uh, and that that's their identity, that's their heritage. Uh, um, there's all sorts of implications there because the Book of Mormon claims to be a historical book, because the Book of Mormon claims to be a history of the, the primary inhabitants of North, Central, and South America, and we know the general authorities for decades, maybe even more, have been telling Pacific Islanders, uh, you know, that they are also descendants from uh, the Book of Mormon. And of course, the problem is uh, not only is there no evidence that the Book of Mormon is historical, but there's negative evidence. Pretty much any any angle you look at the Book of Mormon, whether it's genetic DNA, uh, archaeological, linguistic. Uh, you know, any angle, uh, the Book of Mormon uh, fails pretty much every possible test in terms of historicity. And so it's one thing to be sort of believing in a, in a belief system that strains credibility. And the idea behind this series is it's totally a different thing. Uh, or I, I'm wondering if it's a totally different thing to be told from a very young age what your identity is, who you are who your ancestors are, and then at some point in your life to find out that, that that's not at all who you are. And so you've been given a false identity. Um, and so we've already interviewed um, one person in this series, uh, and uh, she was from Brazil, and it was lovely to have her on. And today we're interviewing Hiram Joe. Uh, so without any further ado, I guess we do want to make just a few quick announcements. Um, as always, we're holding several workshops and retreats uh, across the country and world. These workshops and retreats are to support people in their religious transition, whether they stay in or out of the church. Uh, we, we definitely at the Open Stories Foundation want to help people um, figure out how to navigate those waters because marriages can be at stake. Uh, sometimes lives are at stake. Sometimes there's depression or anxiety, uh, again, marital distress, etc. So we're holding these events. July 7th through 8th will be in Dallas, Texas. Uh, you, can, you can register for that right now. Um, August 11th through 12th, we'll be doing a retreat in uh, Salt Lake City slash Utah County. It'll be a mixed faith marriage retreat with myself and Julie de Azevedo Hanks. She's an active faithful member. And we think that if you're in a mixed faith marriage where one believes and one doesn't, it'll be very balanced and catered towards supporting you guys in your relationship. Um, September 14th and 15th, we'll be in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and then uh, October 20th through 22nd, we'll be in Sydney, Australia. And we would love to see you there. And then for the end of the year, November 9th through 10th, we're going to be in San Francisco, the Bay Area. So, um, and next year we're thinking about putting together a cruise and we'll be announcing that soon. But if you want to register for these events, go to mormonstories.org slash events and you'll see the links to click on any of these events. In addition, um, Dan Witherspoon, for those of you who are trying to stay active in the church and are looking for support in that way, Dan Witherspoon and Natasha Helfer Parker, July, um, uh, July, sometime in July 2017, I don't have the exact dates with me, um, they will be holding a retreat, uh, a two-day retreat as well, and they do really good work. Um, so we hope that you will, it will be putting that um, on our events page soon. So anyway, uh, please check out these events. They're very highly rated. People love it. They tell us that it's, it's, uh, helped with their mental health, it's helped save marriages, it's helped them communicate with believing family and friends, etc. Um, so we really hope you guys will, uh, will join us. Really quickly, the dates for um, the, 
the retreat with Dan and Natasha. Oh my gosh, I still don't have it. So we will let you guys know. Okay, so uh, we want to thank everyone who donates to the Open Stories Foundation, to Mormon Stories Podcast. We just want to make sure everyone knows that uh, if you love this programming, if you believe in what we're doing, if it's helped you, if you think it'll help others, we just always have to make a plea that you will please consider donating uh, $10 a month, $25 a month, whatever you can. Uh, all of it is tax deductible in the United States. And it goes towards the mission of the Open Stories Foundation, which is to support people going through or impacted by a religious transition. And uh, we do great work. Uh, Amy Grubbs and Cody Layton are part of our staff. Uh, and um, please support us. All right. So without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and jump to the main purpose of today's call. We've got 63 people who have joined us already. People on Facebook Live, we really want your comments and questions. Uh, we've, we're monitoring those comments and questions, and we really um, want to see you participate. So please do. Uh, we've already got Hans Matson joining us. We've got Kimberly Anderson, Rachel Peterson, Jaina, Noreen joining us from the UK. Uh, Brian says, I'm getting skinny. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate that feedback. Don't objectify me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Watts, Gracie, lots of cool people. Danae Graham, I want to welcome everyone who's joined us so far and those who are about to join us. Please do post comments and questions um, on your Facebook live stream. Okay, so Hiram Joe, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on Mormon Stories. Thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah, I'm excited to be here, John. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm really, I'm really, I feel like this is kind of a special, um, this is a special topic, and I'm sure it's very special to your heart as well. So let's just dive right in. Um, tell us about your background as, as a Mormon. I am a third generation uh, uh, member of the church. Uh, my my uh, patriarchal grandmother um, was the first to be baptized in her family, um, and then and then her husband, my grandfather, followed, and then my my father, uh, uh, and uh, my my mother, and then I, I'm the oldest of of six children, and then you know we all followed in baptism, um, uh, growing up on the reservation as well. Which reservation? Where is it? Uh, it's Navajo Reservation. It's um, the Four Corners area in New Mexico, a um, place called Shiprock, New Mexico. <clears throat> and the Four Corners, is that where four states come together? Yeah, yeah. Utah, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you know anything about the missionaries that first tracked it out, your grandparents? I, I, I mean, I've never met them. I, I don't know their names necessarily. Um, my, my grandmother has all that information. But uh, yeah, it was missionaries that uh, came to the door and, and knocked, and uh, they didn't have a, a, a baptismal font um, at the, the branch there. I think it was a branch back then. So they, uh, they went to the, the next town, which was about 30 miles up the road, for their baptism off the reservation. Um, but yeah, like I said, everybody just followed, you know, after grandma was baptized. Um, now, this would have been, I'm guessing, in the, what, 60s? uh 59 50s okay and this would have been when the church was still really caring about the native americans when the church was proselyting to the native americans this would have been before spencer w kimball was president of the church but i'm sure that uh i i'm guessing that the indian placement program was uh at least beginning or starting to pick up by the 60s or 70s um and I guess I'm saying this must have been at a time when the when Native Americans meant a lot more to the church than they do now. Is that your understanding? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I was born in '79, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, I remember a lot about what Spencer W. Kimball said uh, in the '80s. Um, but yeah, I, I would assume that uh, the missionary work was was pretty strong on the reservation at the time uh, during the late '50s. Um, do you have a sense for what the church meant to your grandparents and, and parents? Uh, did it help them? Was it, was it an asset? Did it, you know, did it feel like cultural imperialism to them at the time? Um, did it feel like just a big help? But, but, okay, so, so my grandmother, <clears throat> um, when I got baptized first, she's still a really very, very devout uh, Mormon, even to this day. She's, uh, she's, she's very sweet. <laughs> um, she'll, she's, she'll, uh, 
um, go up to the podium and bear her testimony every fast Sunday. Um, she, she's pretty notorious for that on the reservation um, in her town. Um, but as far as, and my, my grandfather has passed on since, um, but they actually, I didn't know this until uh, just so lately that they were sealed in the Manti Temple, Manti Utah Temple. Um, and, uh, but yeah, she, she's really the only one that I would say is pretty devout. I have a, a younger sister who still attends pretty regularly and just got sealed in the Monticello Utah Temple. But his, your, did you ever hear stories from your grandma about what the church meant to her growing up? Did it change her family's life? Did it give them hope? You know, what, what, what would have appealed? What about the church would have appealed to your grandparents? I, I, I don't know much about my grandfather uh, as far as his testimony. Uh, I'm sure that he, you know, took a likening to it. Um, I remember my father saying, uh, you know, they had same home evening scripture study pretty often. Um, but, but, you know, like, like I said, my grandma, um, she, you know, she's, I think it, I think it really did help her strength. Um, she's had a, a couple of the children who have passed on as well. She's uh, endured a very, very, very hard reservation life, uh, but still maintains, you know, like I said, her testimony. And, and I think that was a pillar for her. Um, and I think she could say the same thing too. And yeah, you know, my whole family knows, knows that about my, about her. How many, do you have an idea how many wards or stakes would be on the Navajo reservation? Uh, it's, it's growing, but I think it's uh, at a very low rate, uh, at a lower rate. Um, I, I couldn't tell you, I couldn't tell you. Do you. Is there at least one ward or multiple wards? Oh yeah, yeah, there's, I think there's more branches than anything. Okay. Kind of independent, you know. Several ward. branches. Yeah, there's definitely branches here and there. So like Chinle, uh, Kayenta, Window Rock, you know, some of those places, they, they definitely have their, their branches there. Okay. <clears throat> did your, did your, um, and these are your, these are your father's parents, right? Yeah. Did yeah. they, did your father grow up on the reservation then? He did. He, my father comes from the Navajo and, and Southern Ute uh, tribe. So he, he grew up in Shiprock, but he also grew up in Ignacio, Colorado, and that's where the Southern Utes are. Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, and did he, was he raised LDS too? I'm assuming he was. Oh yeah, yeah, he, yeah, for sure. Yep, his, his whole life. Okay, and did, have you heard from him what that was like for him? Did he love it? Did he not love it? He, he shared a, fair, a few stories, you know, like I said, you know, they, they had their family home evening and, you know, my grandpa was, was one to make sure that that was taking place in the home Monday nights. Um, I'm assuming that they were pretty active and went to church every Sunday. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, typical, you know, Orthodox uh, Mormon family on the reservation. On the reservation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I guess this is a, this is maybe a delicate or sensitive thing, but like describe what, how reservation life might be different from middle, middle-class white, you know, America, if you're able to even, is <laughs> yeah, it like no, way not, different? Is it similar? <clears throat> not sensitive at all. I mean, I can only tell you my experience. I moved off the reservation when I was 10. Okay. We, we moved, you know, we moved up the, up the road about maybe 25 miles um, to a border town, which wasn't on the reservation. Um, I, I mean, you know, they have the same stuff, you know, they got the same stores. I think, you know, they're growing with, um, more, more retail stores, department stores, things like that. Um, you know, I, I like to go back when I get a chance. I mean, it's, it's, uh, gosh, you know, what, what can I say? I mean, it's a place that I go where I feel home. Uh, it's good to be around, you know, family, people of your skin color. I mean, you can automatically relate, you know, as opposed to if I'm, you know, I'm living about an hour north of Phoenix and, you know, I go to a place like Phoenix and, you know, it's, I mean, it's just, you know, you see all kinds of different people there, but, you know, definitely uh, toned down, smaller, um, more comfortable. Um, it, it's a very, very easy, you know, at your own pace type of a lifestyle there. Um, and uh, yeah, it's pre pretty simple life there. I like it. S Charlotte, Charlotte Dosumu wrote My Son. Is that your mom? Yeah, yeah. I, I told her about it. She's tuned in. All right. So your mom's tuned Before. in. Yeah. Got to behave, Hiram. I, I know. I know. Yeah, I said Sh a prayer before I before I went on. Shout out to Charlotte. <laughs> okay, so you, why do you have a sense for why your family moved away from the reservation when you were ten? 
yeah, not to get um, you know too de detailed. It was uh, yeah, uh, it was kind of a kind of a big deal, kind of a mess with um, the Navajo uh, kind of government, um, the red tape <laughs> mess of the of the Navajo government. <clears throat> so my father's an artist like I am, and um, you know he uh, he he had some early success. He he had some some good luck um, and fortune in his career, uh, and I, I don't know if it was that you know we had grass we had a nice fence you know we grew up in a trailer um but you know we we had the cars we had the trampoline and uh you know the neighborhood kids would flock over to our place and you know want to come to, come to our house and play i mean so you, you could kind of see a little bit you know um uh, hints there and there that that you know my father was having success so uh uh somebody representative of the, of the tribal government came to my uh um, door and they knocked and they wanted to ask you know, kind of, you know, my dad questions about, you know, well, you know, where's this money coming from and kind of just really nosy a little bit, if, if you will. And uh, <clears throat> um, they, they wanted um, to make things brief and to cut it kind of short. They were wanting some kind of uh, stipend or, or maybe a percentage, uh, you know, and, and I think they wanted to kind of tax him because he had his studio right behind our, our trailer there. Um, and it was a studio that he built. He pulled in this, 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 uh, oh man, what do you call it? Um, kind of like a, the, the tin storages, you know, it, it was a good size. And then he had like a shade house built outside. He would work out there. Um, so I think they just got curious and a little nosy. What um, kind of art was it? it? He's a stone carver. A stone carver? Yeah. So he had saw blades going and, you know, white dust powder would be flying everywhere. <laughs> cool. The neighbor's house would be white. Uh, but, but yeah, no, so I, I think that was kind of, that pushed him into the direction of, okay, well, if, if we don't, uh, if we're off the reservation, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have this problem and, and I could just, you know, do what I want. So we moved off and sure enough, you know, we had a house built there and he has the studio uh, there and had no problem since. Before moving to that part of your life, um, what was it like? Do, do you have any memories of what it was like to be a Mormon? You know, are there can you say there's Navajo beliefs or native beliefs? And was there any conflict between, uh, you know, the Mormon beliefs, the Mormon practices and the native beliefs on the reservation? I mean, at the time, you know, as a kid, you know, you, you're just so naive. You just don't know. You just, you know, go with what your parents say and your primary teachers and your church leaders. Um, unfortunately, I think the church leaders kind of frowned down upon, you know, uh, you know, the members that were Navajo uh, or even just Native American, um, um, they, they frowned on, 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 you know, them going to ceremonies or supporting, you know, kind of living their, their traditional lifestyle. Um, so there would have been, there would have been ceremonies that would have occurred. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, there, what types of, what types of ceremonies? Even today, I mean, you know, even just as simple as like a sweat lodge ceremony, you know, I mean, there, there's so many different ceremonies for different things. Um, tell, tell us what that is, just briefly. What's the sweat lodge ceremony? A sweat, a sweat lodge ceremony <clears throat> is basically, it's, it's held in, a, in either a, mu a mud kind of a um, structure. It's, it's a round structure. That, that was the traditional way of doing it. Um, and it's completely dark inside. There's no lights. Uh, and it's, it's very, very insulated so that the heat can stay inside. Um, and in the middle of the, the sweat lodge, um, there's a little, there's a pit dug maybe about, I don't know, three feet by three feet <clears throat> and um uh, ash the ash rocks are brought in they're 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 heated up for a couple of hours before so they're burning hot and then they're brought in with a shovel and i mean you, you know in the navajo way uh the sweat lodge is only for men um so it's a kind of a major or a patriarchal thing and um so family members friends close close friends will come in um, and we'll kind of, you know, the door is always facing east, um, and we'll we'll kind of just file in together, and we'll s circle around the entire hogan, um, and we'll just sit on blankets or pendulum blankets or you know just the ground, um, and the the door will just have a flap, a Pendleton blanket, sheepskin, buckskin, whatever, and they'll they'll close off. They, they they can't have any kind of opening. You can't see any sunlight, so we'll close it as much as we can. Um, and they usually have a hatake, that's, um, that, that's medicine man in Navajo or singer to kind of lead. Uh, uh, I like to call them sessions. I, you know, 
I, I should probably wire with that because like you're know, growing up Mormon you have temple sessions <laughs> but yeah there are, we, so we'll sit in this this sweat lodge and um, the medicine man will kind of make an introduction and then everybody will get a chance to make an introduction who they are what their clans are um, and uh, he'll sing songs of, of healing um, he'll sing songs of animals uh, you know things of nature um, and uh, if anybody there's times that um, you know each everybody who's in the sweat lodge uh, they'll have an opportunity to kind of express themselves with whatever if they're struggling if they're you know succeeding in something if they want to share their happiness anything with family their career um, and, and they get that opportunity and there's more songs singing and so we do a kind of a four uh, I, I like to look at it as like a football game there's there's four quarters about 20 20 minute uh, intervals and then there'll be a break we'll come out kind of cool off a little bit and then go back in um, it'll last about two hours and how often would those be held in a in a given town do you think um, I, I know people that do them once a week. Okay. And, uh, so growing up, would your town do that with some regularity? Oh yeah. Yeah. They would be happening everywhere, all over the reservation. And you would be, and your Mormon church leaders would tell you to avoid them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I knew that there were active members that were, that were participating in sweat loss ceremonies and other ceremonies as well, but kind of behind the leaders back type of thing. Um, they, they would be, you know, it, and then it would, the issue would be, well, you can't worship two gods, you know, that, that uh, issue would be kind of inserted in there. And it was just, I mean, you know, but, but, but there's, I, I'm guessing you don't have to profess to a certain set of beliefs to do a sweat lodge, to participate in a sweat lodge. It's, it can be, right. you could just go to have it be a cultural community, sure. personally spiritual moment, right? Yeah. I mean, it, you could do one with us john if you if you wanted to there's not like a navajo temple recommend you have to to get to attend a sweat lodge where you there, there's no worthiness interview there's no worthy interview absolutely no or a creed <laughs> that you have to attest to no no okay, no, okay. anybody's welcome you do you bet. have to pay do you have to pay money to be able to get in uh no um okay some people will come in and make a little offering 10 20 bucks at a time um, okay and, but that's optional Okay. Optional. Um, okay. So growing up, there would be, were there other types of ceremonies that you were kind of discouraged from attending besides? Well, like I said, I, I didn't know a whole lot about the traditional lifestyle okay. growing up. Yeah. You know, Cause I, you, I, you wouldn't, I mean, you was, wouldn't. Yeah. I was eight, nine, 10 years old. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Yeah. And so your, your, your brothers and sisters would get baptized. Was that a problem at all? My younger brothers and sisters got, got, got baptized. Yeah. Yeah. That was no problem on the reservation. Oh yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, okay. Yeah, everybody, everybody's baptized. Okay, so you guys move off the reservation. Where did you move to exactly? We moved to a place called Kirtland, New Mexico. That's funny. Yeah. Was yeah. it na was it named after Mormons or? Oh yeah, definitely Mormon. Oh, town. so a bunch of Mormons. Yeah, absolutely. And is that yeah. where you grew up through high school then? Yeah, when I we see we moved in 1990, and um, I, I believe I was a fourth grader when we moved there. So and what was that like? Was there some culture shock? Definitely. Uh, big time. Um, at the time, I would say, you know, the population of the town was probably, oh, man, I, I want to say at least 65% Anglo. And, and then the, the rest would be either Navajo or Hispanic. And it, it definitely messed my friends. Um, you know, I had to get used to, to paved sidewalks, street lights, you know, grassy parks. It, it was nice to have that. We didn't have that on reservation. It was all just dirt, dirt roads and, you know, um, tumbleweeds. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, you know, we went to school and, and, you know, struggled a little to, to make friends. I had my friends from the reservation come up and they would have sleep. We have sleepovers and play video games. And so I, I, I didn't want to let go uh, of that. It, it was definitely hard for me. Um, I think my, my other brothers and sisters struggled with that as well. I couldn't say so much for my parents. But the interesting thing, John, about that was, you know, we actually, as a family, we actually got accepted really well um, because my father got called into the state presidency. Whoa. He, he, was, uh, he was 27 years old. 27, 28, I want to say, right up in that area. Um, he was called before we moved. Um, huh. So he thought it would be easier to, because he used to have to drive the, the 25 miles or whatever to, you know, his stake priesthood meetings which were held, you know, 
pretty often throughout the week. And then he was gone all Sunday, of course. <clears throat> and I, I, I would just add in that or throw in there that that was probably another reason why we moved uh, to Kirkland. The stake center was probably about three miles from, from our house. So you moved within the same, uh, within the same stake. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Was there, um, okay. This is a weird question that popped in my mind. Could the Anglos, as you call them, tell the difference between, you know, Hispanic kids, Mexican kids and native American kids, or they, they treat you all <laughs> like Brown kids. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I, I don't think at that time, um, as fourth, fifth graders, I, I don't know that that was something that they, you know, felt like it was important to, to distinguish. Okay. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. Maybe I, I think the Hisp Hispanic kids spoke more fluently their native language. And maybe that was one way they could tell as opposed to Navajo kids speaking their native language. Um, would your, would your English have had, would it have had an accent? Did you? I, I, I probably, I probably did. Like I said, this is back in 1990. So, uh, it, it's kind of hard to, to answer that. But did you I, grow up speaking Navajo in your family? Uh, not not a whole lot. Um, if we heard any Navajo, it was just coming from grandparents. So it was mostly when, English when they came. So it was English. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So I guess I'm I guess I'm getting at was there did you encounter a lot of racism either you know out of the church or in the church or did you feel racially like you were pretty much the same as everybody else? I definitely felt like an outcast, like a, like an outsider. I mean, you know, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot I can tell you about, about this particular uh, topic. I mean, you know, when we first moved to Kirtland, um, you know, showing up to, to, you know, primary, um, I mean, it was just me and my, me and my siblings that were the only Brown kids in class. I mean, I, at the time, I don't remember really any other Navajo families at least active in our award. Of course, my dad was, the, you know, the second counselor in the state presidency. So we had that expectation and, you know, <laughs> we, we had to go every Sunday and we had to be supportive of dad and have that kind of image, you know. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, that, that's not to say that, you know, we, we had really strong testimonies and, you know, we knew that that's where we needed to be, you know, that, that, that type of thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I definitely had some run-ins with, with some Anglo kids in the area. <laughs> Um, I, I think I did get in a, a couple of fist fights uh, younger. Um, I, we had a we had a, a, a kid. Um, he was my age, and I don't I couldn't remember how it started, but uh, we kind of tossed some words back and forth. And he he was he was in our ward, um, and um, he he I remember we got into a, a verbal verbal argument at school, and uh, one of the things he came back to me was, you know, well at least I'm not made out of poop. <laughs> uh, you know those type of things so yeah we i mean we got i mean that's one incident incident out of probably 20 i mean so we, we would have those growing up for sure um definitely felt uh, uh not not included so much um it, but but john as i got older uh i want to say high school i i did buddy up with with a couple of angle kids that were you know we, we kind of i guess went off went off the what do they call it the straight and narrow <laughs> A little bit and, and started doing something you know egging houses you know um i started cussing a, a little bit more um you know things like that and uh you know they were with me too so it seems like the the kids that were kind of going off the path a little bit they were the ones that i got along with <laughs> you know as opposed to the to the kids that were you know um teachers form presidents or you know um deacons form presidents things like that um so yeah yeah i mean i it, it was hard. It was hard. You know, I, I, I go to school and, you know, I think, I think the Navajo kids there now, now kids from the reservation, um, it, it was five miles away. The, the nearest part of the reservation was five miles away from where we were at. Uh, and they started to kind of come over into Kirtland bit by bit more and more. Start seeing more Navajos. Now it's probably, I want to say 85% Navajo. Um, right. You know, and then, and then, you know, 15%, whatever, but, uh, um, so I really only dated white girls, white Mormon girls, <laughs> you right. know, because I would see them at church. I would see them at mutual on Wednesday nights. I, you know, we took some trips together. Um, I just knew them better. I didn't know the Navajo girls. Um, if I knew Navajo girls, I was probably related to them, that type of thing. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. And so I, I think, I, you know, I also had Navajo uh, boys that, that uh, wanted to fight me. 
So I got in fist fights in high school. Because, I think because of that. I think they, they thought that uh, I was maybe, you know, kind of, uh, you know, somebody who was ashamed of, of his race or culture or something like that. And um, Because your, your friends were Anglos and the, you dated Anglo girls. I had a lot of Anglo friends. I had a lot of Anglo friends, a lot of Mexican friends. Um, I had a few Native friends. But, but mostly, you know, it was because of church. You know, we're, we're taught to, to, you know, hang around Mormon friends and, you know, date Mormon girls. And that, that was kind of the, you know, the council in church. Right. So I let's, talk, I- let's talk about the Lamanite narrative. Would that have been a part of your family lore, a part of your upbringing, a part of how your family identified and thought about themselves? Talk about yeah. that. Yeah, dad, dad would come home. Um, and and we'd have him on evenings, uh, and he would teach things that were taught to him in in his stake priesthood meetings, things in high council meetings, um, and so the the you know the teaching was um, not just from dad but other leaders as well was well you know why why are we brown, <laughs> um, and it was well it was because of what uh, Laman and Lemuel did in the Book of Mormon, um, we we learned that they were disobedient that they were. Uh, you know, rebellious uh, men, and that they, uh, they they went against you know their father Lehi's words, and uh, you know when, when the cursing came down, you know God, you know gave them a mark or, or a, a, a curse of skin of blackness. You know I think in Second Nephi is where it teaches that, um, and and that's you know that's why we're we're brown, but but it's okay, uh, you know we're okay now um, because we have the gospel and and. And uh, we can just kind of move on and, and you know, prosper and be successful in, in the gospel. And uh, so that, that's, that's w- what my understanding was uh, for all these years. And did you wear that with pride? Was it like, I'm a Lamanite, you know, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. We're special or. No, no, it was hard. It was, it was definitely hard. Well, what was hard for, about it? I mean, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to ever think that I was, I mean, what did I do? I mean, if, if that was true about Laman and Lemuel, I mean, that's, that's their, that's their deal, you know, have them take it up with God. I mean, you know, how, how many, how many generations did I come afterwards? Um, I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, take the beating for somebody else's <laughs> mess ups, you know, screw ups. I just didn't think that that, that was right. But um, I, I mean, I, I went inactive in, in high school though. You know, I, I didn't, uh, I, I just, I think the main reason was I just didn't feel accepted there, but it, I was bored too. You know, I just, I didn't know any of the historical, you know, problems. I, I didn't know any of this stuff. I just I had a, another friend who was Anglo and uh, he was bored too. And he had a truck and uh, he, he said, Let, let's go to Subway. Let's go to, well, I don't even know if Sub, Subway's there now. I don't know if it's there, but we had a Dairy Queen was definitely there. So I think we'd go get a chicken strip basket or something like that. And then he dropped me off at home, that type of thing. You know, I already be home when, when, my, when my parents got home and, uh, you know, there were things like that, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. Do you remember liking or disliking the color of your skin at the, you know, growing up, wishing it were different, loving it, being proud of it? I, I think it was, it was definitely hard, probably in mid school. Um, I, it, so it was definitely harder at church. Um, I, I didn't know that I, I just didn't feel like I fit in. Um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I was ashamed of it. I just didn't feel like it was hard to, to fit in with, with, with Mormonism as a, you know, as a whole in its entirety. Um, was there ever an issue about you as a, as a Native American dating, you know, white girls? Did the parents ever have a problem with that? Did ward leaders ever say, hey, we don't, you know, we don't mix? Because I know Spencer E. Kimball taught, loved Native Americans, but taught that there should not be the mixing of the races. Did any of that rhetoric appear yeah, in your childhood at all? Uh, nobody's come to my face and told me. I, I don't think there was a huge problem, but I'm, I'm not saying that things were, weren't saying behind closed doors type of thing. Um, the, the girls that I dated, uh, I mean, of course, they were just kind of whims. They were just, you know, a quick, you know, I don't know, a couple of weeks or whatever. And then, and then we, you know, we, were, we broke up or whatever. But uh, yeah, I've never heard anything from anybody. Um, nobody said anything, but I, I, I know that that, that was taught um, by the leaders, um, the idea of dating within your, your, your own race. Um, and so that, that kind of put me, uh, 
I guess, at a confused state because, you know, we're taught to date within our own religion. Um, and so here I am, this Navajo kid. <laughs> okay, I'm dating within my own religion, but, you know, we're also saying to date within your own race. And there's, there's no Navajos that are, that are members. <laughs> um, so that was kind of my, my situation. Okay, so you never got in trouble, so to speak, for dating. Um... No, nobody's called me out on it. Absolutely, and, and I, you know, my, my parents were the type of people that didn't, uh, you know, um, discourage us from making friends or dating outside of, you know, our Navajo culture or race. Um, parents were pretty open-minded people. Make friends with everybody. <clears throat> got it. Okay, so. Um... So you went inactive. What what brought you back? I uh, I, I left. I graduated high school um, and I left to Phoenix. I did uh, a couple of years of school there, and then I moved back to pursue my my art career. Um, and I had a, a buddy in high school um, who knocked on my door one 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 evening. He was dressed in his white shirt and tie. <laughs> A uh, really, really good buddy of mine. He was he wasn't a member though. That that was the that was the funny thing. He wasn't a member until just probably several months before he came to my door that night. Um, he had he had some scriptures in his hand, and you know, so of course I I mean I didn't know what was going on. I let him in, and uh, you know we sat and visited, caught up. I hadn't seen him in probably a year, uh, but he he said that he just got back from a meeting at the at the state at, at the singles branch. I said singles branch, well. What do you mean? Are you Mormon? <laughs> uh, so he he invited me to church the following Sunday, and we went to church, and um, uh, it, it was definitely a, a weird experience. Um, but it you know the songs, the hymns, the prayers, all that started to kind of come back to me. Um, and uh, you, you know I'll just I'll just be honest. There was a there was a girl there <laughs> that was kind of pretty. Uh, and, and I, I, I think I, I came back the next week um, specifically for that. Um, and uh, we, we had started dating um, and uh, she took me to Institute and we, we kind of just fell back into the church together. Um, and, and that was my, uh, my ex-wife. Okay, so, so a kind of a, a cute girl kind of snatched you a little bit. A, a little bit, yeah, yeah, my, my friend and then, and then the girl. Kinda, okay. Kind of work together, I guess. Okay, so you um hadn't served a mission by this point? No, no no mission. Thought okay. about it, but but yeah, decided So not. you you, you never served a mission. No mission. Okay, so you you kind of fell in love with this girl and you guys got married? Yeah, we we got married civilly uh in the, in the traditional Navajo way. Um and then a year later, uh we were given the opportunity to go to the temple. So uh, a year later, we did go to the Albuquerque Temple. And we're okay. There. Okay, so you guys were sealed. And um, so any interesting things happen regarding, um, you know, the church? Uh, did you become more active? Did you become more believing? And did you study it more? And talk about anything you want to that leads up to kind of your let's just say crisis of faith. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I got to put up my, my little outline here just so I don't miss anything. Um, so yeah, immediately, I think we started going to church together. Um, and you know, we were engaged in everything and uh, we were just, we still attended the, the singles branch and I mean, it is all right. You know, it's just the typical single people, you know, wanting to meet people uh, to date. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we were set, we were okay. We sat by each other, you know, uh, and our, our bishop there was, was encouraging and um, was working with us to go to the, help us go to the temple. And, and he actually was okay, surprisingly, um, that we were gonna get a Navajo uh, style uh, wedding, um, that, that we were gonna have one. And, and he, didn't, uh, he didn't have a problem with that. So that, that, was, that was a big thumbs up. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, so we, so we got married and, um, you know, we just uh, we just started attending the family ward, and um, <laughs> I, I wore earrings at the time. I had little, little hoop earrings. I was I was I was kind of a little punk back then. 
um, had, had tattoos, have a couple tattoos. And I don't think I wore the, the white shirt and tie in the beginning. But, but I eventually, I, I grew into feeling more comfortable at church. And, uh, but with that came, you know, well, I, I think I better probably dress the part. And, you know, otherwise, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little too outcast, outcast-ish. So uh, I, I lost the earrings, uh, covered up the tattoos. And uh, eventually, I got a calling um, in the Elders Quorum uh, as a kind of a missionary coordinator guy. So I went out with the missionaries a lot. Um, they would come by the house. You know, we'd feed them. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you what, I, I don't, I never had a testimony in the church, John. Um, I, up, in, up until this point, I, I don't feel like I ever had. Uh, but as I started going out with the missionaries, I would say probably at least three times a week, um, I was kind of the driver guy. <laughs> when they, because at, at the time they didn't have a, a vehicle. Um, some of them had bikes. So I would drive them to their appointments and just kind of, you know, support them and sit there. And I didn't know a whole lot about the gospel, but I was learning. Um, but but I would kind of sit in the corner of these of these houses of these the living room of these homes, and just hear the missionaries speak, you know, with truth and power, uh, conviction, and they would teach about the Book of Mormon, they teach about the Lamanites and the Nephites, and how Christ came to America, right, and how the book was was a was written to the Lamanites, the Native American people, and and this is for our day, you know, and it's easier to understand than the Bible. Um, and, and that was, that was the way, that was the way they taught. And, and we got missionaries from all over the place. We had a couple from, I think, Argentina. Uh, in fact, the, the first missionary that I, that I got closer to was from Argentina. So we had a lot in common, you know, he was darker skinned and whatnot, but we, you know, church basketball was another thing that kind of brought me in. You know, I went on Wednesdays, love, love, love playing, love playing ball. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think mostly it just came from the missionaries. We got close with them. They'd come over, we'd feed them. My ex-wife would, would prepare meals, and we just talk about the gospel. You know, I, questions would come, and what about this, and what about that, and you know, I got fired up. I was fired up. I wanted to, I wanted to, um, I wanted to make a difference in other people's lives. I wanted to be able to raise my family, um, you know, that way. And um, but, but at this time, like I said, I was, I was kind of, I didn't, I didn't involve myself in my Navajo tradition. You know, the, the gospel took over, and I would say probably. <clears throat> uh, well, a year later, we, we went to the other Albuquerque Temple, and um, now that I look back on it, it 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 wasn't uh, <laughs> it wasn't the experience that I was told it was going to be. Um, it, it, very very uncomfortable um, in a lot of areas there. Um, you didn't like the temple ceremony. Uh, no, no, I, I didn't like getting undressed, um, and 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 then praying, and then having every everything be white. You know, the clothes, the walls you know, and being the only brown person there again, you know, gosh, how many times do I have to go through this? And uh, now my wife, my wife, Mike's wife was, uh, was Navajo as well. So, um, you know, so, so we both kind of grew up in that, you know, had similar experiences. But we, we you know, we, we got into the, uh, uh, we, we got our endowments taken out the same day we got sealed. So we, we had it all in one day. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting that now that I think about, think about it and think back on it, um, you know, we had family members that had been sealed, you know, friends, you know, our, our friends in the war, the bishops, uh, Hey brother Joe, uh, you know, don't, you know, I want you to know that uh, this is, this is the best decision you're going to make in your life and you won't regret it. Um, but I want to warn you, uh, the adversary is watching you and he's aware of what you're trying to do. And don't be surprised if, if, if your car breaks down on the way to the temple or, <laughs> Or if uh, your your bank account freezes, or um, you know your, your your wife and 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 you get in some some kind of argument, you know, or these thoughts come, these doubts come into your head, you know, don't be surprised, you know, that's the adversary working on you. And uh, sure enough, for some reason, I think something happened to the bank account. <laughs> um, we just we couldn't get money out for the trip or something, and uh, we got discouraged, and and I think Mike's wife was crying, something like that, and we called, you know, our parents. We don't know if we can make it. <laughs> uh but eventually we we uh we figured it out and then we got to the temple and, and we we got sealed that day um it it was supposed to feel beautiful and uplifting and i was supposed to cry have tears of joy but i i, I didn't i didn't do that I, I felt like my navajo traditional wedding was was a lot more special and, and and only because you know family and friends um that drove in were able to to come and see us get married 
um, as opposed to the temple, uh, there was my dad and my grandmother. That was the only family that I had, and then her parents as well. So your mom wasn't able to attend? But yeah, my mom, my mom wasn't attending church at the time. Um, she, uh, she's kind of grown into Catholicism um, to this day. Got it. <clears throat> okay, so the temple experience wasn't what you thought. Um, a little bit disappointing, and but you were you were faithful in it to in it to win it, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't understand everything, right, John? Things don't make sense. Things are mysterious. God will reveal these things that don't make sense to us, sense to us that are uncomfortable that we don't understand. He'll reveal to the faithful. So I was patient. I, I you know, I I heeded the counsel of the brethren. And I just had faith and went forward. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, so anything else that was interesting, you mentioned in your notes, um, an elders quorum president and developing concerns with racism. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll just kind of, I'll just kind of leave off on, on where uh, we started attending our, our ward as a, as a new, as newlyweds. Um, so, you know, that, that was a ward in, in Farmington, New Mexico. It was, it's a town just 10 miles from, from where I grew up in Kirtland. So we, we were right there. We, we were pretty close to family. Um, a great ward, even to this day. In fact, I, I, uh, I uh, reconnected with somebody that, that we knew <laughs> through Mormon Stories Facebook community. Um, I thought that was interesting. Um, I, I was just young, I was a whippersnapper. I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But, you know, nonetheless, the bishop was great. The Elders Quorum president was great. The missionaries were always awesome. And that's where I got my testimony <clears throat> uh, was serving in that, in, in that, in that ward. Um, like I said, served a lot with the missionaries. And uh, so, you know, we took the opportunity to, to move. And we moved. We found a home. We were renting at the time. And uh, we wanted to own our own house. So we, so we bought a house in Kirtland. <laughs> we go back to my hometown. And I'm dreading it. I'm dreading it. Oh, man. You know, I, I know what people are going to say. I know how they're going to react. You know, there, there's Hiram Joe, the, the guy, you know, who threw the parties, the guy that, you know, <laughs> corrupted my son. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I just I didn't know how they would re the people there, the Mormons there would receive me um, coming to church. Now, Mary got his life together <laughs> and with, with, with a suit and tie boots you know testimony and everything uh so we so we go back and um i don't remember the first calling that i got but eventually i, I would say with well no i got called into the eldest presidency that's right um as a second counselor uh and, and that was that was okay i mean you know i, I was new to it uh and it, you know the, the the president had been serving for i think almost three years and i think it was his time uh and he was released, and I was immediately called in to be the Elder Quorum president at 27 years old. Scared wow. <laughs> yeah, and and this was almost my home ward. Um, it was it was another ward. It was second ward. I grew up in the third in third ward. <clears throat> so, um, what was that like, and how did it go? Ah, uh, it was challenging it was confusing there, there was no instruction um the bishop uh at the time uh, you know he, he wasn't really specific on what my job was i was hoping he would kind of help me out uh so i just winged it <laughs> i just winged it um and so the, you know the first thing that i thought um uh, uh, would be a good thing was to rile up all the around up all the inactive uh uh, core members and then just pay me a visit and that's what, exactly what i did you know i called some counselors and um you know we went we went from door to door we introduced ourselves let let them know who we were invited them to church that type of thing activities um i held a couple of uh, elders quorum activities and immediately i got on my ppi interviews <laughs> um i figured it was a good way to get kind of get to know you know some of the brethren in the ward um and immediately started making friends you know i think we're doing okay uh, you know, home teaching assignments were made, um, but but I think I I I, uh, I took it upon myself to assign myself eight families to see 
everybody else had about two or three families and my, my counselors helped me out with that. But I, I just, I, I specifically assigned myself uh, the Navajo families that were inactive. I wanted to know what was going on. I wanted to know where they were at, why they weren't going to church. Um, not, not in a, a, a demeaning way or, or, you know, wanted to chastise them or anything like that. I just wanted to know because I wanted, you know, people like me, I wanted them at church too. <laughs> um, so I would, I would go and visit these families and, and, you know, it was really interesting. They all had different things to say. Some of them were offended by other people in the ward. Some just didn't believe anymore. Um, and I had one, one family, the husband, um, we, we got into some, some doctrine and some scripture. And, uh, yeah, he, he said this to me, he said, uh, you know, he said, I, I think I have more in common with the Mongolian people, Mongolia, than I do with Jews or people of Hebrew descent. And uh, I, I didn't know what to say to that, John. I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know the history. Um, and, I, and I always remember that today. And uh, he, he never came to church. I, I, I tried. Um, but I, I wouldn't know about the whole, you know, immigration, um, you know, the Asian immigration and then you know, having them come into uh, the United States through the Bering Strait until probably, I don't know, five, six years ago. So that comment didn't, you didn't fully understand what he meant by that. You just were struck that somebody would say they didn't feel like they not belonged. really, not really. I didn't, I didn't know the Mongolian people at all. I mean, I hadn't known none, none, none of their history or customs or what they even look like. Okay. So he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. So as your testimony is growing and as you're serving as Elders Corn president, how does that affect your relationship with your family or what, what's happening with your family? Uh, we're, we're okay. Um, you know, my art career is growing. My testimony is growing. Uh, marriage is good. You know, kids are young. I think by this time we have at least two, we have two little ones. Um, yeah. Um, how about they, your, how about your, your dad, your mom, your siblings? Um, uh, well, my father, his, his testimony is slowly deteriorating. Um, I, he he just he just found that he identified more with his Navajo culture. Um, it, it's funny we have almost the exact same story, John. <laughs> um, so he you know he uh, he got he got released. Um, I think I think I was a junior in high school when he got released, or maybe I was a senior, something like that. And um, yeah, you know my, my parents did divorce, you know so so they went through that, and uh, my my father. Um, I think he just, he was lost for a long time. Um, you know, he went through a faith crisis and, and, uh, he just didn't know where to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> so he, um, he had, you know, long story short, he, uh, gosh, I wish he would have came on with me, John. He, he would have been great. <laughs> um, he had somebody come to his studio his workshop one day out of the blue uh and this man was a was a navajo medicine man and just threw his arm around my dad uh and just said hey we we're come we were just passing through i thought i stopped by and, and he's a friend of my dad um <clears throat> and he said listen i heard about what you're going through and i'm sorry but i just want to tell you that i love you and, and what can i do to help you and, and so they had that conversation. My dad just wept. My dad just wept. Um, and so he, he went through a faith crisis and a divorce at the same time. That's got to be hard after having served in the state presidency for how long? He was there for nine years. Yeah, That's a long time. Eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, people still come and tell me, hey, I remember your dad when he used to talk in the state conference. I never, I never, I never forget what he used to, what he used to tell us. He used to speak with power and precision and authority. <laughs> so he, you know, he still has the respect of a lot of people from that. Uh, but uh, you know, that was kind of the that the um, circumstance when the medicine man had come by. That was kind of the turning point for him. And this medicine man had invited him out to uh, a ceremony, a Navajo ceremony, a healing ceremony, out on the reservation. It was, it was. Um, the first time I think he went to one in a long time. Like I said, his time was was put into 
the church. The priest didn't need to be serving, uh, getting his family ready for <laughs> uh, the celestial kingdom. Um, but, uh, I, you know, he told me that story, and it's like, oh, oh, my gosh. Oh, man. So um, he, did, he did try to go in the church. He, I remember him trying to go to the temple. He would, you know, we'd be in Mesa, Arizona. He would drop me off the temple. I don't want to do a session, you know. So he tried. He tried to stick it in there or stick in there. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, it just didn't work for him. And, you know, he, he, he tried to go into priesthood meeting. And his, his response was, you know, um, I just, I can't get over the, the brethren there talking about politics. They're talking about who's going to be the, the next mayor in Farmington and who, you know, uh, you know, George Bush is doing such a horrible job. You know, Barack Obama is doing such a horrible job. And that was their priesthood lesson. And then, you know, okay, well, we'd like to, we'd like to uh, close, you know, who wants to offer the prayer? And that was their lesson. And he was getting nothing out of that. that was, he was absolutely getting nothing out of that. And so he just stopped going. <clears throat> did, did you get a sense for whether he was starting to doubt the church's truth claims or its history or anything like that? Yeah. And oh, and yeah. did he talk to you about any of that while he was struggling? Yes, yes. We his, his thing was, you know, he said, Hiram, the, the the you know the Angles, the 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 um, state president, and the you know the bishops, you know, they're 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 predominantly Anglo in that town, at least at least when I was there. Um, and when we were having these conversations, just and we would say, you know, their their time is up. Their time is up. It's time for the Lamanites to take over. It's time for the Native Americans. Um, you know, to uh, fulfill the promise that Jacob had made in the Book of Mormon about, you know, blossoming as a rose. I mean, I haven't seen it, have you? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he, he, would, he would mention how the, how the Anglo people were the Gentiles and that they were adoptees, you know, they're, they're just adoptees. They're not, they're not the real authentic, you know, chosen people. And that was, he's still, he's still on that right now. I think, I think that's kind of how he, that's his mindset still right now. But, uh, but no, we, we actually, um, we, we had some run-ins together. We, my mindset was, no, dad, you need to go to church. Don't matter. Have faith. I mean, you taught me everything I know about the gospel. <laughs> you, you, we had fam home evening. What about your testimony about Joseph Smith? You know, your testimony about the Book of Mormon. Um, and, and, you know, there, there was a time I think we didn't even speak for three weeks because, um, you know, like I said, my mindset was, you know, find the lost sheep, pick a family member out and, you know, um, invite them to church, you know, have a discussion with them. Um, and he, he didn't want to hear it, John. He didn't want to hear it. But he also had bishops come by, state president come by. And these are his good friends, um, you know, pe people he taught. And that, that was a really difficult thing for him. Um, so he, he kind of went through a phase and that was part of his, 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 his faith practices. But uh, yeah, it, it just really led to an estranged uh, relationship. But but it wasn't only with him; it was it was um, probably with my with my siblings too. My siblings didn't uh, they didn't attend church as, as much. I don't think. So um, so it sounds like with your dad, it was a combination of the sh you know losing his calling, probably the shame of divorce, being single in the church is super hard then he wasn't seeing the progress with the Lamanites that I think he, the scriptures probably led him to expect. And it sounds like he was just kind of bored and felt like church was irrelevant. Is that? Yeah. 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 That was probably the, the first stages in his disaffection towards the church. Okay. Anything else worth noting? Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. No. So we just, you know, I knew something was wrong. I, I didn't want to have that kind of relationship with my dad. So I did call him up and I apologized and I just, I never, I never bothered, bothered him again. I, I never said anything about the church. I just, I just let him be. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was, that was kind of my experience as I was from president. Um, you know, it, what I loved about it, John, though, was, was it, it helped me get out of my shell and, and serve people. I mean, I, man, I remember um, my secretary, you know, it, he was, I didn't know he was going through a divorce and uh, he finally, he finally told me and I went over to his house and um, I was just there with him. You know, I, 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 I hugged him. I wanted to weep with him. Um, I, I was just there for him. Um, you know, I, I, I drove home an elder who was an active, who gave me a call out of the blue. It was probably about 1130 at night and he had a little, little too much to drink at a bar. So 
um, I told my ex-wife, I got up, I got changed and uh, drove over to where he was at <laughs> and drove him home. You know, there were things like that, that I just, I, I just, I love doing that. Those are memories that will always be kept and um, I'll savor those. But the, but the calling, a specific calling that I was from president helped me to serve. It really got me out of my comfort zone and, and uh, just made me realize how special people are. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I got released um, and uh, served, got called into um, the bishopric as the ward, uh, ward executive secretary, is what they call it. And that's, I served with the bishop then that, that uh, we had discussed earlier. <laughs> when he got a hold of me uh, several months earlier, that, that was the bishop that I served with. Okay. Um, so uh, it seems like at some point you started to develop questions about race in the Book of Mormon. Is that, was that during this time? It, it was, pre well, it was, no, it, it, I always knew something wasn't right with me being the only Native American at church and then have everybody else be Anglo. I, I knew something was wrong with that, especially when the Book of Mormon teaches and prophesies that this is for, this is for the Native American people. If it was for us, then we'd all be here. <laughs> um, but I just couldn't wrap my finger around it. And then, I, of course, I always had questions about, you know, how come the Blacks, the Black people never got the priesthood until 1978? Why is that? I always thought that was a really, really interesting, um, uh, you know, part of Mormon history. You know, I, I, I had, I, so I, I did question the bishop. Um, I think I talked to the state president at least once about that. But mostly I just, you know, discussed it with my ex-wife. Um, and we just, you know, we, the conclusion was, well, we don't know. It was the Lord, you know, Lord works in different timing. He doesn't work on our timing. And it was just her time to have it. Um, and uh, I, I was never satisfied. I was never satisfied with that answer. I knew there was something else, you know, under the rug there that either they, you know, either the leaders just didn't know or they were hiding. Um, but uh, there was a, there was a um, specific uh, elders corps meeting we had. Um, there was a, there was a young, uh, there was a young man in, in our quorum. He was, he just turned 18. So he's brand new to the quorum, straight out of young men. And uh, we were that that year we were going to be teaching or learning out of um, Spencer W. Kimball's the teaching of the of the prophets or presidents something like that. Uh, so I had I had the the teacher the teacher of our quorum, you know, discuss a little bit about who Spencer W. Kimball was, some you know, kind of his timeline, and um, you know, he came across the 1978, um, you know, opening of the the priesthood to the blacks, and. Uh, out of the out of the blue, this young eighteen year old kid, <laughs> um, as naive as he was, his hand just shot up just like that in the back of uh, the class, um, and and his question was, why didn't the blacks have the priesthood back then? He asked the teacher that, and the teacher pretty much gave the same answer, um, and. Uh, he just kind of nodded his head and said, okay, well, do you think it was because the leaders were racist or the prophet was racist? <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't know whether to laugh or to smile or what, but deep down in my mind, I was thinking, yeah, this kid knows exactly what's going on um, as young as he is. And I, I wanted to say, yeah, it was because he was racist. The leaders at the time were racist. Um, but but I didn't I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't lead the brother astray the brother astray in the quorum um, and I don't remember what the teacher teacher's response to that was but we just kind of moved on um, so you know like I said we just we, you know um, I didn't we didn't really go online you know there was there no really no resources for that particular issue um, we just asked we just asked the priesthood look priesthood leaders and that's all we got but that was kind of the first step um, in going into that so anyway um, so. I did ask my bishop once. I stayed after a priesthood meeting and I uh, pulled up the scriptures where the Lamanite cursings were. And um, he had me where, uh, it, so there was a scripture that said, or it read, um, the, 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 pu the white pure and delights him, I think is what it was. I can't remember where that's at. So he had me, I said, I said, Bishop, I don't know how I can teach my kids this. This sounds very, this sounds very racist. 
oh no 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 brother joe you, it's, it's your misunderstanding it's it's no that, that's not you know we can't take things so so literally so he had me take out my pen and mark out the word wider and put pure wider represents purity that, that's what that means uh so you know of course the obedience priesthood holder that i am i had to i had to go with that i had to go with that i couldn't fight it anymore otherwise that's that's going into apostasy <laughs> uh did and, that and I, how, did that work for you to just kind of oh, mark out the scriptures oh, and no. fill in your own word i mean i mean since when is, can he change scriptures um that, that was just his interpretation uh so that yeah that, that didn't work didn't work for my ex-wife and it was just it was just it was just as it is so we left it and just didn't think about it and uh, of course you know the holy ghost tells me to <clears throat> focus on taking my my wife to the temple let's just go to church let's just serve in our callings let's pay our tithing let's fast let's go to the ward activities let's just do the the member missionary work come on brother joe just have faith it's no big deal. That's very, it's a very insignificant thing. It's not even relevant to have a testimony. That's not, that's not what's going to get you back to the celestial kingdom and live with God again. Come on. Right. So that's where I stood. So, uh, so as I read through kind of the outline, one of the things you mentioned was being introduced to Mormon Stories podcast. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about before you talk about kind of when things really started falling apart? Um, that, you know, at the time I, you know, like I said, I was doing everything that I could in my power to, to, you know, remain a, a worthy priesthood holder. You know, I was, you know, I had my flaws, I had my mistakes, but, uh, you know, we were active and, and, you know, like I said, we were reading scriptures and just doing everything possibly that we could do to, you know, to endure to the end and, 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 you know, make it to the celestial kingdom. Um, so we, uh, at the time in Kirtland, um, there was a I th I, there was a racial division. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I, I call it a racial community division. So what had happened was, um, and I was serving as elder quorum president at the time as well. Uh, we let's see, we um, we had a uh, let's see, the high school, the, the schools there uh, shared. Um, it, you, you, they were in the same district as a couple of other schools on the reservation. And those schools were probably within, you know, 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So um, they all share, they were all in the same district. So there were certain members of the school board that were Mormon, um, Anglo Mormons, that wanted to split the district. So Kirtland, they wanted Kirtland to be independent. And have you know the reservation schools take care of their themselves, um, so that would lead to r the the Navajo uh, students that were going to school in Kirtland to kind of go back to the reservation. In, in essence, you know, we it, uh, if you live in Kirtland, then that's it. If you're on the reservation, you know, we we don't have room, we don't have the finances, whatever. We want you to kind of go back. Um, and that really just kind of tore the town up apart there for about a year. Uh, that was a really difficult thing to go to go through. Um, and so my younger children were taking bilingual classes at their elementary school. And, um, you know, their teacher was just, just the most sweetest, energetic, thoughtful, considerate Navajo woman that you could ever, ever meet. Um, and she taught, she taught their bilingual class. Uh, they, they wanted to fire her. They wanted to get rid of any bilingual class out there um, or in the town of Kirtland because they just didn't, they said that they, it wasn't in the budget to, to pay for the class, to pay for the teacher and to give her a salary. And, and this was my, my children's kid. This is, this is their teacher that they're trying to get rid of. And that, that, that hurt. That hurt because my kids would come home, you know, singing their Navajo songs. You know, they were picking up words. They were hearing the creation stories. The ceremonial stories and it was just awesome to have our kids you know that young uh, and we did our part to teach them at home uh, as much as we could as well but uh, that was just a beautiful thing to have and they wanted to they wanted to wipe that out so this created a lot of division in, in the town and you go to church oh man you, all, all the brown people would need, need back 
and, and the white people be in the front. We lost friendships. Um, people just stopped talking to us. So we kind of had to buddy up with other Navajo families and, and kind of discuss the issue. And um, there was petitions going around. There was even, a, a, you know, somebody said that somebody pulled a gun on somebody. Um, it was in the newspapers. It was all over Facebook. <laughs> it was Facebook wars, people bashing. So essentially it was the Navajos versus the Anglo Mormons. And that was very difficult and awkward to be part of because because we were both. So I literally felt like I was a tug of ro tug of war rope being pulled, you know, both sides. Do we do we choose our our Mormon friends, the, the the truest church, you know, the people that are part of that community, or do we choose our blood Navajo family? Like I mean, that's that's the tough thing to go through. Um, so, you know, um, we, we decided then that we would, we would move. <laughs> um, and, uh, I think after about a year later, I think we, we made the move to Arizona. And so now, now we're, we're near Prescott, Arizona. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, that was it, a little tidbit. It must, I it must've been weird to have members of the church pushing for segregation, pushing to send the Native Americans back to the reservation to deintegrate the schools. That must have been discouraging. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now that I look back on it, John, I'm not surprised. I'm not. It doesn't surprise me a bit. Back then, I was, yeah, I was in shock. Why? Why are you doing this? I mean, it's it's fine. I mean, you know, we all can benefit by by coming together and, and having you know two cultures or three cultures or four cultures blend. And and I mean, that was that was how I grew up. That's what I believe in. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, but that's absolutely. that. It seems like that was the philosophy behind the Lamanite placement program. You want to eliminate the language, eliminate the culture, yeah, and the whole goal to make the Lamanites turn white and delightsome and to blossom like a rose was to become American, to become Westernized, to speak English, and to, yeah. to to turn their skin white and become educated like uh, like the gringos, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, to cut to cut their hair, cut the braids off. You know, that that wasn't uh, um, I wasn't typical. You know, I guess approved. Uh, uh, you know, Mormon appearance. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like it was almost the same exact thing. Um, no leader's gonna come out and say that, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, the the kids that went on the placement program. Um, I have uh, my mother almost went. Um, she married my dad. My dad talked her out of it and married instead. <laughs> but uh, I have, uh, I've got really good friends who have gone on the placement program. Um, some say, yeah, it helped them a little bit. Some say it was horrible. Um, it, you know, the ones that didn't have a good experience, they were, you know, same thing. They were outcasts, um, you know, in the family home. Uh, one particular really good friend of mine said uh, he always got blamed for everything. If there was a mess, if, uh, Somebody, you know, left the faucet going. If you know something was a chore wasn't done around the house, he got the blame for it. He always got the shaft end of things, and you know those type of things. But uh, you know, so I think it really goes both ways. It, it everybody has their different stories. Some say it was a good experience. Some say it wasn't. Some have completely just gone inactive. Some, you know, I have a really good another really good friend who's Navajo who went on the placement program. That's a uh, high councilman in North Dakota right now. Um, so. Yeah, so, it's, it's hard to tell. So that that worked for him, but for others it didn't work so well. But yeah, but I guess the larger point is kind of cultural imperialism, right? Of of the white man wiping out the inferior languages and cultures. Is that is that kind of what you feel like was going on in Kirtland? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I'll just say that I, I felt like I was robbed of my identity because we, I, you know, like I said before, the leaders just didn't frown up, down upon, you know, as in the Book of Mormon said, uh, you know, the Lamanites who follow into, into the tradition of their fathers, you know, they'll never make the pro progress or they'll never get to know God or, you know, um, not in those exact words, but um, that, that was, that's the counsel in the Book of Mormon. Is to not follow in the, in the tradition of our fathers, uh, and so yeah. So you go to church. I mean, everybody's in a white shirt and tie. Um, 
you know, it's like the way you speak, the way you talk, you gotta, you gotta kind of act like them. You gotta kind of act like the, the white priesthood leader that has a white shirt and tie with his Book of Mormon in his hand and is, he's sitting up straight and tall and he's, he's with his family and, you know, there, there's just this, this beautiful, you know, um, image of what a celestial Mormon family looks like. With the Navajos, you're just, you're just not going to get that. Maybe some might get away with it, but I know that I struggled with, I mean, just even playing basketball on Wednesday nights was a struggle for me because, you know, they'd kind of circle in their own little groups and cliques. And, you know, I just, I just couldn't identify with them. I, you know, I couldn't, um, I couldn't be myself and joke in a Navajo way, you know, with them as opposed to being at a family reunion or, you know, being at a, a birthday party with my own, my own family and my own blood, my own skin color and, you know, cracking jokes and laughing and just having a good time and feeling comfortable. You just couldn't do that. You couldn't do that at church. But yeah, I mean, you, I mean, if you wanted to be accepted, if you wanted that testimony, if you wanted uh, the blessings, I mean, you certainly had to, you had to, you had to act a part. You had to act a part. 